4.3 billion people live across this vast continent called Asia, and we are telling their stories. On this edition, Recovering a Lost Art, how some Afghans are trying to revive their country's film industry and pushing the boundaries of television. Writing on the Wall, a group in Pakistan enlists the help of ordinary citizens to clear Lahore's walls of hateful graffiti. And Weaving a Bright Future, an ancient art is giving China's Yi women not only a living, but also empowerment. I'm Natalie Carney, and this is Assignment Asia. Welcome to the show. Art is not only a form of expression, but also a window into societies. And that's particularly true for film and TV. But in Afghanistan, that art form has crumbled under decades of war and oppression. Now, some Afghans have taken on the task of restoring their country's films, hoping to bring the industry back to its former glory. As I discovered in Kabul, television is also defying Afghanistan's conservative culture, even in the face of danger. These images have never been seen by outside eyes. They reveal an Afghanistan long forgotten. It's a miracle these pictures are even being witnessed at all after being lost long ago in a mangled hoard of film that has undergone years of corrosion. Well, <laughs> Ahmed Shah Siddiqui and Mohammed Qasim Karami were two of 11 men from the Afghan Film Commission that hid the negatives of some of Afghanistan's most revered films from the Taliban, a conservative and ruthless regime that ruled the country between 1996 and 2001. The Taliban banned all films and pictures, saying they were against God. But some of the films, including the ones in this shed, were not spared from the Taliban. باز تصمیم به نیک زمان طالبان تصمیم به بردر دادن فلم ها گرفتن امی محل که فعلا ما قرار دادیم روز اول فلم ها را در انمی قسمه در دادن فلم ها را در دادن یه دو داتش چیزا زیاد زبانه کشید گفتن که از ایباد روزانه پلچرخی ببریم روز قطعی های فلم خالی میکنند امی داخل آرشیب فلم ها را دو موتر سی موتر امکانات روزی که بود According to Mohammed, 30 to 40 trucks full of positive films were burnt. They included Afghan productions as well as imported foreign films. But not all the roles were found. Tasmin Griftan, Kotia film, Kotia Inisha Paskardan, Filmori Jadardo, and a body of Pulcharchia Mebur, and Kotia Pass Maker, and the Dub Mutar, Filmora Mebur, and Pulcharchi Darmidon, Kedaruzoi Ocher. که ممکن عکسش هم پیش ما باشه که بعدا گرفتیم امی کو وارد این بغل انگار قطیای خالی فلم پت شده بود و ما که وقت میافتیم یگان قطی فلم ده مزیر قطیای خالی میزدیم که had the taliban found out about it the men say they most certainly would have been killed 
So this is the upstairs back of the shed. It was the films located in the front that the Taliban confiscated and then burned. So all the film that was hidden up here was not discovered. However, the Taliban later set light to the entire shed, and that's why some of the footage you see here has fire damage. Despite that, despite the very hot conditions up here, as well as other weather damage, this film, the film commission say, is relatively salvageable. So this film will later be restored digitized and then added to their archives. Today this shed still stocks some of Afghanistan's most precious and valuable films. We are going to be able to make a film for 6,000 hours. The film is available to you. The majority of the film is available to you. The majority of the films are available to you. The majority of the films are available to you. The majority of the films are available to you. The majority of the films the Taliban no longer rule Afghanistan, but its conservative ideology still does, putting pressure on Afghan filmmakers, particularly those in front of the camera. Afghan actress Akila Rezai Kamel's family has received threats because of her job. The <laughs> فقط مشکلات محیطی اینا را و می داره که مثلا ما در سینما کار نکنم خانواده ما اصلا آر می دانستند که ما من حیث یک اونر پیشم در سینما کار بکنم Regardless of her awards and international accolades, Akila is estranged from her family. The conservative ideology that feeds public dislike of cinema has affected the industry. Industry film گفتن هم می دانیم که ما صنعت سینما داشتیم. از شروع با یک جنجال فرهنگی ما دچار بودیم. Some of the country's most internationally recognized works are also its most controversial. Osama was a film about a girl living under Taliban rule who disguises herself as a boy to support her family. It won a Golden Globe and earned almost four million U.S. dollars abroad, but was viewed negatively by conservatives in Afghanistan. This is Park Cinema in central Kabul, a dilapidated old building showing foreign films in a dark, grungy movie theater. Here is where we met Saeed Farouk Haibat, a cinema director for more than 30 years who has seen the industry crumble around him. Only four cinemas remain operational in all of Kabul. <laughs> Old projectors, when working, show whatever films the theater can get a hold of to whoever is willing to watch them. Sharwale Kabul, lazim didan mara basfat mudiri cinema dar dar arse cinema dar imedat khidmat em kad si sal shar dar alat jam kandan as fakat ama kam onda ke nafas bar ayi ga basa shavar. Shomo mi bine dami cinema ipar dana fardasi taim nami. Aga film ay khub basa wasail peshrafte tekniki khub wari chawa masraf kunan saith foru kaybat as mudiri mi cinema ipar. Saeed remembers a time when his theater was busy with people. As of a takriban 200 company film Afghani sakhta shada jawaz am giriftan. Davlat kumak na me kona film durust Afghani besada mesus falay qabel. In all ta moshachi mojatar film ay Afghani da dos daran. Misar jad dos daran film Afghani khub wali, music wali, sound wali, unar peshay khub va dostan khub. Yet that final curtain has not yet been drawn, thanks to a few courageous filmmakers. In the television industry, defiance of Afghanistan's conservative norms is growing. Tolo TV is known for being a bit of a renegade for pushing the boundaries of Afghan society. Tonight is the finale of Afghan Superstar, a musical talent show, something unimaginable just a few years ago under the Taliban. This is the control room. This is where the magic happens. It's all on that stage down below that many of Afghanistan's top performing artists are breaking some of the country's most conservative traditions and pushing back against these taboos. But all this comes at a price. Insurgents have threatened to attack the performance. Security is tight as hundreds of audience members wait anxiously to get in. You see, in 
this show and what we see in the news, there's like a huge, huge difference. difference. It's, yeah. like, it's like water and fire, you know? Uh -huh. Like what's happening here? Mm -hmm. And the news, it's like the opposite. There's like yeah, bombs, there's war, yeah. there's killing. We were and really here it's like peace and like mm -hmm. fun, you know, you want to be here. What makes Afghanistan's superstar even more exciting and groundbreaking is its showcase of Afghan female talent. Ediana Saeed is one of Afghanistan's most popular female pop stars. She's also one of the most outspoken and has faced several threats to her life for it. I talk uh, uh, women's rights. I always uh, uh, believe in equality between uh, women and, and, and men, which is not normal in this country. They even announced a fitwa against me in one of the uh, very religious TVs. And they said, whoever brings Ariana's head uh, they will go to heaven. It's showtime. The host, well-known Afghan singer Noor Haya, takes the stage to a wave of applause. Four hours later, anxieties run high as the two semi-finalists are announced. Omid Parsa is named Afghan superstar. <laughs> اونا را ارائه میکردن مردم با دل و جان میشنیدن و میپسندیدن و نظر میدادن تاثیر خود گذاشته و مردم بسیار سعی میکنن تا جذب بشن با هنر و موسیقی و فعلا فکر میکنم دید مردم بسیار زیاد عوض شده ما با آینده افغانستان بسیار زیاد روشن پروگرامای مثل ابر ستاره حتما تاثیر گذاشته بود که اونا سعی میکنن تا در مورد کار ما نظر بدن but that is not what the conservatives of Afghanistan want, and the threats to the channel were finally realized on January 20th, 2016, when seven employees were killed and many others injured in a suicide bomb attack. The Taliban claimed responsibility, accusing Tolo of ideological warfare by trying to convert Muslims from their true beliefs. The Taliban have threatened other attacks should they fail to refrain from spreading propaganda and wickedness. Programs like Afghan Superstar have been spreading hope for people near and far. Award-winning documentary filmmaker Jawad Taiman came back to Afghanistan after many years abroad to try and save a dying art form. He's training the next generation of Afghan filmmakers. Taiman says these young, inspired filmmakers are driving the change his country needs. Film is media, and through this you can educate a lot of people, you can pass on a lot of positive messages. Um, and if you're an Afghan, you can make films about your country to show a positive image about your country rather than negative uh, stuff that, that, that's been shown on television. Back at the Afghan Film Commission, some of the country's timeless films are being archived for generations to come. Right next door to the hidden room he risked his life to build, Ahmed Shah Siddiqui is busy digitizing an old black and white Pashto film called The Silent Wander. It's one of the last works filmed before Afghanistan's civil war all but killed the industry. از انانی مردم افغانستان از آثار تاریخی کشورهای ولایت افغانستان در مجموع انانات کلی افغانستان و اون کلچرهایی که البته به گذشت زمان آیستای سم اما روش زمانی خود از دست داده و فعلا ما همونا را داریم حتی آثارات تاریخی که در اثر جنگا کاملا هست به این رفته ما همون آثارات در مجموع است اگر اراده خداوند باشه و یه جنگ و تنظیمی از کشور کاملا برداشته شه میتونه با تصویر تصویرهای دست داشته افغان فیلم احیای مجدد آثار تاریخی در یک کشور صورت بگیره و به نهای تاریخی غنی که در کشور است جای حوالی خودم میتونه حفظ Government funding for these restoration projects remains scarce. Still, many continue to give their all to preserve the past and change the future through film and television. Cinema tanha sahtan film nis. Cinema yek farhang azimi az ki baad baou bisar tawajjo shod. I cinema ra az bain mi baran. Khodesh az bain namira. Az bain mi baran. Afghan films have been filling theater seats abroad, exposing the world to its repressive past and then pushing back against it. 
10 Afghan films produced with the support of foreign companies have been nominated for the Oscars foreign language category since 2002. And just like their brave predecessors, new generation Afghan filmmakers are taking it upon themselves to keep the momentum of change going through film and television, no matter what the cost. As efforts to revive Afghanistan's film industry continues, the country is becoming a popular location for foreign films because of its mountainous terrain and picturesque valleys set against remnants of war. Coming up, how one group in Pakistan have replaced offensive graffiti with inspiring paintings. Pakistan's city of Lahore is notorious for traffic jams, air pollution, and walls stained with hateful messages. But one group is looking to change all that through art. Daniel Khan met volunteers who are out reclaiming their city by painting over graffiti with inspiring images. With its majestic Mughal architecture and sprawling lush green lawns, Lahore was once known as the capital of gardens. But as the population rose, the city's landscape was also vandalized by unchecked and haphazard construction. And now, residents seem accustomed to ugliness and chaos. Piles of garbage, traffic jams, the air and noise pollution. Amongst the more disturbing eyesores are the graffiti like this that the walls of the city end up being stained with, often consisting of communal and sectarian hatred. Stained by vulgar language, the city's walls have seen layers of filth mounted over the years. But commuters recently came across a pleasant surprise. Instead of graffiti, there are now paintings. This is Mudassir Zia, the man behind the wall paintings initiative in Lahore. We want to change the look of the walls. When we go outside in the streets, we see the walls open, representing advertisement of different people, companies, some local doctors, and government slogans. Uh, after so many months, uh, we decided to paint them, to give them words, to give them uh, you can say a new look for the people so they can speak with the people with the common people a people who are going through the streets and they want to know what's positive happening in the Pakistan in 2010 Mudassir and his team put up an art competition in Lahore they used social media to gather like-minded volunteers from around the city they called on anyone who wanted to paint there are many people who are doing engineering degree or doing MBBS or doing CA, but they want to paint. So we decided not to restrict this event for only artists, professional artists. We want every person to come outside so that every person have a contribution for the society, for Pakistan. And people responded. The volunteers were initially divided into 60 teams, each with the desire to save their city's walls. Mudassar says that at first, passers-by thought they were a bunch of madmen. Even uh, the local government was totally shocked when we put the idea that we want to paint the walls, we want to remove the wall choking, and they were saying, what will you do? How will you do? This low-cost initiative has brought together thousands of artistically inclined adults and children to improve the face of their city. They say it is a way for them to reclaim the walls of their city from messages of hatred and ugliness. The wall art is located at several crossroads throughout Lahore. 
There were very bad messages, political, religious, debates and stuff like that. So it was very, very uh, disturbing for the people to see that. It was some people would write very bad things, which I can't say. So we wanted to clean it all up. We wanted to clean Pakistan. We wanted to re-create uh, the walls of law. The walls are now painted with exuberant images, from the abstract to the metaphorical. Each and every painting here has a message. Every person who passes by these walls will relate to the paintings in some way or the other. What we are doing is not wall chalking. We are spreading messages of peace, knowledge and harmony through color. I think it is a continuous way of conveying a message. I mean, when you watch television, the images come and go, but these walls remain here and constantly pass on positive messages. But in a mostly conservative society, initiatives like this are rarely accepted. Mudassir's team faced opposition and criticism, which they countered with paintings of positive and patriotic images of Pakistani culture and famous personalities. In 2011, uh, some mullahs uh, come at, at the place and they ask us why you are doing this, why you are going to remove the slogans uh, related to their madrasa. But we convinced them. We convinced them that you write on the walls about your madrasa or any other thing or any other conference, that's not a right place to write this thing. Posters must be displayed on the cardboards, on the boards that are specifically for these things. So they agreed for that. It is not just a painting extravaganza. The team also hopes to educate people by painting messages of public service. There are always different themes around here. Where we focus on education, uh, rights for women, poverty, poverty elevation. And uh, you see cultural impacts of Pakistan, cultural aspects of Pakistan. And how can uh, we promote different uh, good habits and good norms in Pakistan? Surprisingly, no one has so far tampered with the painted walls, a sign that the initiative has gained public acceptance. Mudassar hopes this would have a chain effect and that people in other cities would also save their country from hate and toxic ideologies that have been allowed to seep into the social fabric far too deeply. For Assignment Asia, I'm Daniel Khan in Lahore, Pakistan. Artisan hopes this low-cost scheme will continue to attract thousands of artistically inclined adults and children and empower them to improve the face of their cities. Next on Assignment Asia, the ancient art of embroidery and how it's empowering one ethnic group in China. Weaving amongst China's Yi ethnic group has a history spanning more than a millennium. But today, it's not just a treasured form of art. In Yunnan province, embroidery has helped lift ethnic women out of poverty and empowered them to shape their own future. This is Dayao County, China's Yunnan province. Rice terraces and mountains line the path to this county at the Chuxiongyi Autonomous Prefecture, a four-hour drive from the capital Kunming. Here, we met the women of the Yi ethnic minority who are busy sewing and shaping their future with their own hands. They are the people of the Miyilu Cooperative, employing a style of embroidery called Yongren Yi, whose history spans 1,300 years and is part of Yunnan's intangible heritage list. In 2014, Miyilu achieved an annual production value of more than 6 million renminbi or almost 1 million US dollars. At the workshop, the women say embroidery has helped them increase their monthly average income by 1,100 renminbi or 177 US dollars and raise their status in society. 
，做什么都要看老公的脸色，家都做不了主。现在我们靠一休，挣到了钱，有了钱，老公抽烟喝酒，反倒要跟我们要了。哎，你不敢发酒疯了。But it wasn't the story years ago. 我们是从中国制造搬迁到这点的，刚搬来的时候，因为土地少，收入低，日子过得紧巴巴的。被老妇的嘲笑，我们一族人是老山人，山老路。但是听了完，心头很难过，很伤心。发誓找个路子，嗯，过过闲闲样的日子。就是还没成立成立协会之前了嘛，就是修女的收入，一年才有，呃，几百块钱，最少就是最，嗯，五六百来的，最多的收入也是一两千来的。所以呢，就是。嗯，也不可观，也只是说，嗯，自产自销。过年过节时候自己修了船，嗯，也是在本地反正里卖，没有销出去。但是呢，就是说传承我们的文化，来保护我们的文化。Yunnan is one of China's less developed provinces, with around 18.3 million people living in urban areas and 28.3 million in the countryside. The Yongren Women's Federation hands out subsidized loans and micro credits to women in the embroidery industry. Youne Xiuni, Yong Zhuo Xin Huan Jin, Zolo Qi Dong Zi Jin, Kailo Shan Die, Youne, Ha Ba Sen Yi Zuo Da Lo Yi Jin Mai Lo Che. Embroidery associations like Ni Yi Lu have been improving minority women's livelihood. Annual production can reach up to 200,000 pieces, and the products are sold to faraway Shanghai, Italy, and France. But how to market them better and bringing them out of the mountains into the wider world has always been a challenge. Well, e-commerce is the answer. The Miyilu Cooperative has already started to sell its products on Alibaba's Taobao website, China's largest online retailer, similar to eBay and Amazon. Just 实体店的话，就远远不能满足喜欢我们 Miyilu 嗯产品的这一些人群，所以我们就是在开了两个网店，一个有个网站。那网站是主要就是宣传我们呃企业的文化的这一个平台。那网站网店呢，就是说呃让更多的人现在，因为现在就是。都是在淘宝上买东西嘛，很多他不可能来到我们，就是来到我们实体店里面，那就是说，我们就做了一些完善的推广。Hopes are high that the country's handicraft makers will be able to join China's e-commerce boom sooner rather than later. The women of the Yi ethnic minority are keeping their traditions alive, handing them over from one generation to another, and with this unique skill, they are able to weave their way out of poverty. Yi weavers have been earning millions of won every year selling their handcrafted products. It's both a tradition and a business model they vow to keep alive for generations to come. You can find out more about this and all the stories on today's program on our website, www.assignment-asia.com. That's all the time we have for this week's program. I'm Natalie Carney. Thank you for watching and join us again on Assignment Asia. Share your thoughts and contribute story ideas for future shows by contacting us on social media.